Okay, everyone, uh, I think we'll be beginning. So first of all, thank you very much for joining in. Um, we will be discussing uh, the NIH budget, both pre- and post-award. Um, and the way that we're going to do this today uh, is, first of all, divide the presentation between, between me, um, Meital from Freemind, and Ed Jameson from Jameson & Company. I will be um, in charge of the first part, the pre-award, uh, and Ed will be uh, talking to us later about the post-award uh, aspects of, uh, of the grant, uh, grant award. So uh, I think we'll begin. Um, my name is Meital Weiss. I'm a director of business development with the Freemind Group. And uh, before I was a director of business development, I was actually a senior grant consultant within the company. And I will be uh, giving you a few details about the budget, different kinds. So a bit about the Freemind Group before we begin. We've been around since 1999, 17 years now. We have 55 full-time employees and a very diverse client base. We work, we work with academics and big research institutes and also the industry, small even virtual size companies, medium size, and all the way up to big pharma. And we submit around 400 applications annually in behalf of our clients. We are basically a tool to help you maximize your funding potential. We help you identify the most relevant funding opportunities. We help you strategize and maximize the application's chances of success. We manage the complex project production processes, lead the joint application writing, and support the final contract negotiations. And uh, basically, we're here to help uh, make Nandu the funding a strategic financial tool. Um, so just uh, some interesting statistics. Uh, the annual pool of money that we're talking about is $50 billion that are allocated annually to fund life sciences. And the majority of that co funds comes from the NIH, National Institute of Health. Uh, and for 2016, the budget of the NIH is $32.31 billion. Uh, and the majority of that, uh, so this is the entire pie char chart of the NIH budget. And what I would like to show you is that the majority of that $27 billion goes out to fund extramural research. And if we were to take a look at the entire NA budget that is related to the extramural research, we were to see that um, the amount of funds that are allocated, first of all, is uh, pretty, pretty significant, but also the list of interests that they have is extremely diverse. Uh, they will basically fund any field that you can imagine. And uh, if we were to take a look at the specific stages of the research, we can also see that uh, from very early stage discovery all the way up to phase three uh, clinical trials are definitely funded within the number of the funding scope. Uh, and from very early stage to clinical stage is also funded by the NIH. So uh, if we were to, to of course, uh, take a closer look at the budget. Uh, it is present within the entire application. We uh, mentioned the budget and the, the research plan that we'll have in the research strategy. We have the budget justification, which will explain why we require uh, the funds that we require, and of course, the budget itself. So today, uh, we will talk about a few concepts. First of all, uh, the budget framework. We will talk about the size, we will talk about the format. And we will also talk about different uh, types of costs. We have uh, applicants and outsource cost costs. We have direct and indirect costs. And I will touch upon all of that today. Um, and basically, everything that I'll be mentioning here today is taken from the NIH's SF424, uh, which is basically uh, the grand bible. Uh, you can find that online. It is not a very short document, uh, but be sure that you read through it uh, before you will begin uh, producing an application, mainly because uh, you do not want to miss any of the fine detail that might uh, uh, prevent you from submitting something that's wrong or submitting an application that's not right for you. So uh, another thing is that the submission process itself is done through an online system called ASSIST. 
Um, it is relatively new. Uh, before we had Assist, we used uh, the application package, which was a very long uh, PDF file. So uh, in order to start the submission process, you have to go into the Assist website. And um, I would like to give you a few examples of the more um, the, the main uh, sources uh, that we usually see. So first of all, uh, we have the R01, which is the Exploratory Developmental Research Grant Program, early stage uh, research, uh, $275,000 in direct cost for up to two years. And you can also add to that overhead costs. There's also the R01, which is the Research Project Grant, um, half a million per year for up to five years. And you can add overhead to that as well. In addition to that, we also have the SBR program, of course. So SBR phase one, $225,000, which includes both direct and indirect costs for projects up to six months. And SBR phase two, one and a half million for direct and indirect costs up to two years. So um, if we're going to mention budget formats, um, sorry, um, uh, we will talk about two types of formats, which, which, is, uh, which are modular budget and detailed budget. So modular budget is usually for domestic, domestic applicants with a budget of up to 225000 uh, per year. And detailed, detailed budget is basically everything else. If your budget is larger than that, if you are not a U.S. entity, uh, if you're not submitting one of the, the few grants that, is, that are um, under the, detail, the modular budget um, scope. So you'll definitely have to do a detailed budget. And we'll go over both of these. So um, modular budgets um, are basically allocated in units or, or multiples of 25,000. So when you're building a budget, you have to make sure that you are sticking to those uh, frames. Um, you do not need a full budget justification. You only need uh, three minor justifications that are the personnel justifications, the consortium justification, and the additional narrative justification. They are not very long, uh, pretty simple. And this is what it looks like uh, in the assist model. You have to, uh, to pick and add the modular budget format. Uh, you can see highlighted in there the direct cost, the consortium, and the total direct costs. And uh, if we compare that to the detailed budget format, so first of all, all costs are broken down into categories, subcategories, and individual cost items. We have salaries for each person. We have travel, materials and supplies, publications, computer costs, and equipment. And of course, we can add to that other costs. So we will now uh, slowly go over uh, these categories. So first of all, uh, salaries. We distinguish between two groups. We have the key personnel and the other personnel. So first of all, if we're talking about the key personnel, these are the experts in the field that will be taking part in the project. You have to add the name, the role, the base salary, and the calendar months. You can see that there's also requested salary, fringe benefits, uh, if, if this is something that you would like to add. And then it just sums up um, the, the row. Um, and one bullet that I would like to touch upon is the calendar months. So a calendar month is the amount of time dedicated to working on this project. This is something that we get asked a lot. So I just brought a few examples. Uh, if, for example, the PI will be uh, dedicating 10% of his time throughout the entire year, meaning over 12 months, he will have 1.2 calendar months. If you'll be devoting 10% devoting, uh, over six months, you will then calculate it as 0 0.6 calendar months. I, I do hope that that is clear. Uh, but the goal is to really uh, account for the time that he will be devoting, devoting to the project itself. Uh, another component that we have is other personnel. If you'll be um, requiring technicians or some kind of assistant that it's not really a matter of expertise, just a person doing this, 
So you add them under uh, other personnel. That could include graduate students, um, any set of skills that is not very uh, specific to the project, you add them under, other, add them under uh, other personnel. Uh, next up is the equipment. Um, you can definitely ask for equipment, but you have to justify it um, very carefully, uh, mainly due to the fact that the NIH funds your research and not your labs. If you require, you need a new microscope, uh, that's great, but if you do not need a specific type of microscope that is critical to the success of what you do, we recommend not asking for the, for the microscope from the NIH um, because, again, that's not what they're after. There's also travel. Uh, if you'll be going into going to conferences, presenting your work, you can definitely ask for, um, uh, for travel costs in your uh, budget. And uh, you can also add, uh, you can see that on the bottom, um, if you want to train people or uh, use uh, someone or, or make them more uh, suitable for the project, you can also ask funds for that. I can even tell you that there are some solicitations that uh, require a trainee or uh, encourage you to train uh, personnel throughout the project, but you have to read the solicitation very carefully and see that this is applicable. Another thing you have is other direct costs. As you can see, it is uh, broken into materials and supplies, publication costs, and of course everything else. If you have some kind of uh, category that is not mentioned, you can also add that below. Um, and then you have the indirect costs. You can add them, you can add the type of indirect costs, and you can see at the bottom, at K, is where you add the budget justification which is the file just detailing everything that you've asked for. For example, if you're asking for $100,000 for materials and supplies, in the budget justification, we'll be explaining what that is. Okay, so aside from the cost that you'll be requesting for your company, there is also uh, funds that are usually allocated for parties outside of the company or the organization. Um, so the first group is consultants, which are personnel from outside the applicant's organization. They are experts in the relevant field, and you'll have to justify that uh, in the budget justification and, of course, in the biosketch. They will contribute intellectual but not physical work according to their expertise. This is very important. If you're listing someone as a consultant, they cannot do wet work. Subcontractors are commercial entities who offer service for fee but do not contribute intellectually, meaning they will not help you plan the research, they will just uh, produce some kind of product that you'll pay them to, but the intellectual work will be done uh, outside of the subcontractor's um, um, scope. The third group is consortium, which is research partners. They contribute both intellectually and they can also perform some, perform some of the work. So uh, make sure that you distinguish between uh, different groups. Um, and the, the consortium partners also have to add a budget. Uh, both consultants and subcontractors uh, don't usually have to, but consortium partners definitely do. Uh, it is also structured like the applicant's main budget. It consists of costs of performing the research and separate into direct and indirect costs. So just to tell you a bit about the difference between both, uh, indirect costs are costs that can be uh, specifically identified with that project, program or activity that, that you are uh, uh, planning. Uh, it has to be directly assigned to such activities in relatively easily, easily and with very high degree of accuracy. Uh, just a few examples are salaries, travel, equipment and supplies that directly benefit the grant supported project or activity. If we compare that to the indirect cost, that is basically um, activities that cannot be identified specifically with the project or the program. Uh, and just a few examples can be facilities, 
operation, maintenance costs, administrative expenses, all of that uh, is under indirect costs. And uh, they are calculated as a percentage of the direct cost base, and the percentage itself is negotiated with the government. The base of the indirect cost is, of course, uh, as we've said before, but there are a few exceptions. For example, equipment, outsource funds, and basically anything else that doesn't fall into the, that category. So a bit about writing the budget. Uh, we recommend building it from the bottom up to be complete and very accurate and concise. And very importantly, you have to be realistic. You don't want to ask for less or more than what you do. You have to ask exactly for what you need. If you'll be asking for more money that you definitely need, uh, again, it will definitely be very clear. If you're asking for less, you might appear as someone who does not understand the scope of work that they're suggesting, which is also not a very good thing. You have to make sure to list all costs, including those that you are covering through the internal and external uh, funds. That is also acceptable, but you have to explain everything about the budget itself. And uh, most importantly, you have to check the solicitation for the budget requirements. Again, read the SF-424, there's no way around it. Everything is listed there. Um, so a bit about uh, the NIH's review process. Uh, of course, we are very focused on the budget here, but definitely you have to remember the bigger picture. The review process is definitely uh, scientific, but it is more of a risk assessment process. They have to consider the risk and the strength of the application and have and they will definitely award only project that will show that uh, the risk is not as, as great as the strength of the application itself. They do this through a five criteria uh, system. The first one, the most important one, is the scientific approach. Basically, the work plan, what you plan on doing, the experiments that you uh, uh, that you hope to be able to complete using the funds. You have to explain the significance of the science. If uh, it is not clear why the, the, the project that you're suggesting is important, they will definitely not fund your science, although it good, can be very good science. You have to be able to explain it correctly. The, the methods that you, you're suggesting also have to be very innovative, very new, very exciting for them uh, to fund. You have to be able to present a very strong leadership. The people conducting the, the, the research itself have to be very, very good at what they do. You have to explain to them, I have to show them that these are the most appropriate people to see this project through. And the last one is the environment. Where will you be conducting your, um, your uh, experiments? Do you have the right facilities? Do you have the lab space? Do you have the right collaboration? All of that is very important. Um, and a few uh, general tips. You have to be able to have a very systematic approach when addressing these um, funds. You have to know the interests of the agency. Again, read the solicitation very well. Be sure that you do know what it is that you're uh, applying for, you have to make sure that you know what it is that they look to fund. You have to present a very complete, very focused project. project. You don't want them uh, to think that you're not exactly sure what it is that you're going to do with the money that they give you, and that is also why you have to have a very, very accurate budget. You have to ask for everything that is necessary, no more, no less. And you have to leverage on research collaborations. Uh, we sometimes hear that people are a bit uh, hesitant to add uh, consultants, to add collaborations. Uh, it will just make your application look much stronger if you are adding on to your team people that will be able to help see the project through. You also have to target the right mechanism. You have to the look at different pockets of money, different sizes of awards and success rates. Of course, we all want to get $100 million tomorrow, 
but that unfortunately is not the way that it works. They want to fund a project that is solid um, and they will not fund a project that is not at the correct stage that they're looking to fund. You have to know also that that might um, influence the success rates that you will have in the project and also different solicitations have different success rates. So you have to make sure that you are, you are maximizing your chances. You have to conduct a thorough strategic assessment, make sure that you do know what's out there. And you also have to have a multi-submission granting strategy. So uh, that was me. Ed will now uh, discuss the post-award section. So just a minute. Take it away, Ed. Thanks, Maytel. I hope everyone can hear me OK. Uh, my name is Ed Jamison. I'm the managing partner at Jamison & Company. We're a CPA firm uh, founded in 1978. We've got uh, about six or seven CPAs with at least 15 years of experience who typically take the lead on accounts. Um, and that means making sure that uh, you stay out of trouble, typically. We've got uh, about 120 clients in 27 states uh, who receive all different types of awards. We work with uh, contractors and grantees, um, Department of Defense, National Institutes of Health, NSF, Department of Energy, and they all have their, their own uh, little nuances that uh, we may get into a bit. So for the next 25 minutes or so, I want to give you a, a really quick overview of some of the compliance regulations that you're going to have to deal with if you receive these awards. The key to that is Federal Acquisition Reg, or FAR 52216-7. Um, that's known as a cost reimbursable type award. Um, I'll talk about which types of awards are cost reimbursable, but uh, we're putting this webinar together uh, as a consortium for a reason. Uh, we're going to talk about the elements of an acceptable accounting system. We'll talk about some of the mandatory labor policies that you're going to need to have. We'll give you an overview of indirect rates and what negotiating indirect rates with the Division of Financial Advisory Services at NIH looks like. And we'll talk a little bit about how your grant gets audited. So first of all, um, the reason our firm exists is because of FAR Clause 52216-7. It's known as the Allowable Cost and Payment Clause. Um, basically, what that clause means is you have a cost reimbursable type award. So even if you get a $1.5 million grant from the National Institutes of Health, they will reimburse you for your costs. So if you only spend $1.4 million and you pull $1.5 million down out of the payment management system, you're going to owe them back the $100,000 that you didn't spend properly. So the way you figure out whether you've got these uh, terms and conditions in your award, if you get a contract, uh, there are typically uh, pages of FAR clauses and it jumps off the page at you. With NIH grants, what will happen is you'll get a, um, a, a hyperlink inside the Notice of Grant Award that when you click on, uh, it will drive you into hundreds and then thousands of pages of terms and conditions. So um, to help make things a little easier for you, I can virtually assure you that if you get an SBIR, STTR, phase one or two with the National Institutes of Health, an R01, uh, an R21, or a BARTA award, these almost always include FAR Clause 52.216-7, which means you've got a cost reimbursable type award. There are a number of different levels of regulations that you have to deal with. Um, first and foremost is the Federal Acquisition Regulations and Cost Accounting Standards. These are sort of the overall rules that the government uses within all the different agencies. Then each agency has the right to issue their own supplemental regulations. So as an example, um, the Department of Defense has a salary cap of about 500K. NIH is as closer to 200K. Uh, DOD will reimburse you for internal research and development costs. NIH won't. Um, DOD will reimburse you for patent costs. NIH won't. So these differences can be very dramatic. Then there are program specific rules that you may or may not be applicable to. So uh, as an example, the SBIR program has ownership um, regulations that you have to deal with. And then there's also potentially grant specific regulations. Anything that's written in your notice of grant award becomes part and parcel of the regulations that you're going to need to comply with. 
So the most important thing that you have to deal with when you have a cost reimbursable award is making sure that your accounting system is set up and run properly. And what the government looks for is your ability to segregate costs between direct, indirect, or unallowable. And to put it very simply, a direct cost is a cost that if you didn't have this project, you would have never incurred this expense. Uh, an indirect cost is a cost that benefits all the various projects, whether they're government or commercial. Uh, as an example, uh, electricity, rent, and unallowable costs are costs that the federal government just won't reimburse you for because they don't perceive any benefit. Alcoholic beverages, penalties and fines. Uh, there are travel per diem limits. So if you like to stay at the Ritz-Carlton, that's great, but they're only going to reimburse you up to about a, a day's end. So uh, you need to be aware of these things. Now, a lot of these regulations have been written a long time ago. So this is actually what the Federal Acquisition Reg says when you read it about uh, timekeeping policies. So first of all, it mandates that you fill out your timesheet in ink on a daily basis. Number two, it says all employees must record all the time they work and they have to sign off on their timesheet. Third, your timesheet has to be signed off and attested to by a supervisor, and fourth, the changes need to be crossed out and initialed and not erased. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm going to try to give you a little bit of a helicopter view here. Labor costs tend to be the largest expense that the federal government reimburses you for. And if I had a big eraser and you wrote in pencil, I could change things very easily depending on what I wanted the answer to be. So this isn't lost on the government, and that's why they mandate the writing in pen and the crossing out and initialing as opposed to erasing. In reality, I would say probably 75% of our clients use electronic timekeeping systems and 25% use manual, you know, handwritten timesheets. Um, the electronic timesheets need to basically create a forensic audit trail that accomplishes these policies that I've laid out in front of you. So as an example, Deltec, Uninet, um, T-Sheets, um, spring, a, a spring ahead. Uh, there are a number of them that will do this, uh, but again, it's an ongoing discipline. So we've had clients who have come into our office and said, hey, Ed, I have a, a, a compliant timekeeping system, and we sort of look at them and go, hey, George, you haven't filled out your timesheet in a year. That's not compliant. So it's not only putting the right systems in place, but it's making sure that those systems are running uh, properly uh, with the proper oversight. So one of the other labor policies that the government requires is that you have a policy for accounting for uncompensated overtime. Now, most of the time when I say this to people, they say, I, I don't really understand what uncompensated overtime is. So let me explain it to you. Let's assume you hire an employee for $80,000 a year. And I, I know there's 2,080 or 2,088 hours in a year. But to make the math easy, let's say there's 2,000 hours in a year. So again, you're, you're working on a cost reimbursable award. So 80,000 divided by the 2,000 hours in a year that you're anticipating that they work says that they're, they're earning $40 an hour. So at the end of the month, they work 10 hours on a project, and you turn around and bill the government $400, 10 hours times $40 an hour is $400. The government reimburses you for that. Now, whether you're using the payment management system or the WAWS system or one of the other government payment systems, the bottom line is you've billed the government that $40 an hour. Now, at the end of the year, you add up the total number of hours that the person works, because remember, on the prior screen, they have to record all the time they work on their timesheet. And let's assume that that person actually works 2,500 hours for the year. So when you do the math, 80,000 divided by 2,500 hours is $32 an hour. Now, one of the things I want to make sure that you're crystal clear about, if you underbill the government, they will effectively silently say thank you. If you overbill the government, they will very quickly want their money back. So the issue that you have here is, at the beginning of the year, you have to sort of estimate what this person's hourly rate is in order to bill. So there are really three common cures to this policy. One, you can pay the person for overtime. Now, of our 120 clients, I would say maybe five pay for overtime. It's not a real common thing uh, to pay for overtime, but it is an option. Number two, you can change the billing rate every month. So as this person works 160 hours one month and 200 hours the next month, you can change their hourly billing rate. If you're keeping manual timesheets, 
you can imagine the kinds of things that go wrong. But a lot of these software programs that I mentioned will automatically dilute or calculate the hourly rates depending on the number of hours that the person works. So this is probably one of the more common cures to this problem. And then the third one is you can simply accumulate the difference and then credit it to the indirect rate pool at the end of the year. So as an example, uh, all of these overbillings get accumulated as a payroll variance on the balance sheet. And at the end of the year, if you had $500,000 worth of indirect expenses and you had $100,000 of overbilling, you could credit that $100,000 back to the pool and you would have $400,000 worth of indirect expenses. So theoretically, by reducing the indirect expenses, you are proportionally relieving all of your clients and all of your projects from the overcharging. And that's also an acceptable solution. So I've been speaking um, all around the country for years now. I, I, I typically speak at the National SBIR Conference. And it's about this point when people's eyes start rolling and I hear them whispering. And, and effectively, what they're saying is, hey, let, let's just record 40 hours on our timesheet so we don't have to deal with this stuff. So I'm going to tell you a quick story about the MIT professor. And, and this is an unfortunate but true story. Um, a few decades ago, I had a client who was a tenured MIT professor. He was a beautiful man, uh, brilliant. Um, and he had some incredible technology. And, and what I really loved about the guy was whenever I went out and visited him, he would always spend the time and show me kind of what was going on in the, in the lab and what was working and what the challenges were. So I really understood his business. Um, and, and it really felt great to, to help him. And he was just a quiet, lovely, unassuming man. And his wife was the CFO, the chief financial officer. And she was loud, obnoxious, abrasive, just it was really difficult to be in a room with her for more than an hour. And I used to drive back from visiting them. I'd drive back to my office and I'd wonder, geez, I wonder how those two get along outside the office. Well, one day my curiosity came to fruition. The MIT professor asked his adoring wife for a divorce. And the next day, there was a knock at the door. The government auditors were there to do a surprise floor check. And, and a surprise floor check is effectively the government showing up and asking all of your employees, what are you working on? How are you filling out your timesheet? And how do you get direction on what to do and how to fill out your timesheet? The auditor effectively went to one of the PhDs and asked him, and I'll summarize for you. Basically, what he said is, I'm working on this commercial project, and I'm charging my time to this cost reimbursable SBIR award. And when the government asked him why, he said, I have a directive here from the CEO to charge all my time to this SBIR award until it's out of money. To make a long story short, the auditor went back to the office, stopped the company's ability to progress, pay, pay the government, progress build the government, blackballed all their proposals, and that MIT professor is now happily divorced and working for a company owned by his research assistant. So as your company grows, you need to make sure that you set your systems up properly, that you set your policies up properly, that you create the kind of corporate culture that you want to have, um, and you avoid misdeeds. So labor is a huge thing, but consultants, materials, travel, subcontractors are also large portions of uh, your budget. Uh, consultants uh, are required to have a consulting agreement with an hourly rate and a detail of the scope of the work they're going to do. Uh, the consultants need to provide you with an invoice that details the number of hours and the work performed. And more and more, when the government auditors are looking at subcontractors and consultants, they want to see the work product. Um, uh, you know, geez, just because a consultant has an agreement with you um, and provides you with an invoice, there is a skepticism that every auditor has in the back of their head that effectively says, how do I know this guy's doing scientific research for you and not putting an addition on your house? So you have to create a forensic paper trail to ensure that anybody can come into your accounting department, pick up a piece of paper, and understand what exactly it is you're paying for and what exactly it is that's being done. So you know, I hear a lot of people tell me, oh, my guy's great. And then I say, OK, but if your guy gets hit by a car, would anybody else be able to explain this? And the reality of it is, in a lot of cases, the, the paper trail is just completely inadequate. So one of the first things that we do is 
number one, try to understand where you're at and where you're going and what you're about. But number two, understand your accounting system and the paper trail and the systems that have been created. So as I've discussed with travel, the government has uh, maximum per diem rates that they will reimburse you for. It doesn't prohibit you from traveling first class, but they will only reimburse you for effectively for a coach seat. Um, so you need to be aware of, of these regulations that limit what you can and can't bill the government for. And there's a couple of different ways people get into trouble. In this example, Northwestern paid uh, $3 million to the government for a fraud when Melissa Feist, who was a purchasing coordinator at Northwestern, noticed some irregularities and red flags um, and brought it to the government's attention. What I really want you to understand is that whistleblowers typically receive 15 to 30 percent of any recovered damages. So in this case, Melissa Feist got almost a, a half a million dollar check for blowing the whistle. So aside from a whistleblower, how do people get in trouble? Well, there's a couple of different types of audits that NIH grants are subjected to. Before you get your award, you're going to go through a pre-award uh, audit the grant specialist will conduct this. It's usually, it usually occurs during the just-in-time process just before you get your award. I have to be honest with you, this is an extraordinarily easy audit to pass. Effectively, what they're going to ask you is, can you send me a copy of your chart of accounts, and can you send me a sample timesheet? And, and you can pretty much go onto NIH's website and you know cut and paste what they give for examples, and there's incredibly little scrutiny given to this. Now, the government also requires you, if you earn at least $750,000 on all of your grants in aggregate, so if you have a $500,000 grant and a $750,000 grant and you've spent $1.25 million, you need to go out and hire a CPA firm that will ensure that you are compliant with all of the uh, rules and requirements of your grant award. And those are known as uniform guidance audits. They were formerly called OMBA 133 audits. Uh, but one of the things that's critical here is that you need to pay for this. And these things can cost twelve to $15,000 if done correctly. And the reason I say if done correctly, and I'm just here to kind of warn you, there are CPA firms who are out there who are looking for things to do in the summer, and they will do these audits for five, six, eight thousand dollars $8,000. And a lot of them, to be honest with you, don't really know what they're doing. When you submit this audit to the inspector general, the Inspector General has the right to audit the auditor's work papers, and they do. So if they find that the auditor didn't actually know what they were doing or didn't do the proper audit procedures, they will come back to you and throw the audit out and make you do it again. Um, so it's, it's really something that you need to just make sure that you're getting guidance from somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, finally, uh, if you negotiate an indirect rate, so if you're requesting a rate of uh, an F&A rate of 40% or more, that process is done through the Division of Financial Advisory Services, and, and what happens is you prepare an annual incurred cost submission, which you need to sort of think of as a true-up report. So effectively what happens here is, let's say in your proposal you thought you were going to have a 65% F&A rate, and you drew down monies from the payment management system at that 65% rate. At the end of the year, the government wants you to prepare this true-up report that shows them exactly what your actual rate was. So as an example, if it was 68%, uh, you have the right to bill them the extra 3%. If your actual rate comes in at 60%, then you owe them the 5% back, and they're going to require you to either reduce your next uh, draw from the payment management system or send them a check. Now, this negotiation process takes place. The Division of Financial Advisory Services is down in Bethesda, Maryland. And, and with NIH grantees who request a 40% indirect rate or greater, you need to go through this process. With all NIH contracts, you need to go through this process. So uh, as an example, um, your R01 and your R21s always go through this process because effectively uh, what Maytel told you, you've got $275,000 plus overhead. So they're going to want to know, well, where did you come up with these overhead figures? Where did you come up with these estimates? So this can be a fairly complex um, thing to understand. So we've created a white paper, Understanding the Strings Attached to Your Grant. If you go to our website, jamisoncpa.com, there's a resource section, and there's all sorts of white papers and videos you can download uh, or watch. Um, so I want to talk a little bit about this 40% 
indirect rate. They consider it a safe rate. And a lot of people uh, who are starting a business, the, the last thing they want is to be audited. So it's not real intuitive um, to ask for an indirect rate of more than 40%. And the government doesn't make it easy. They don't encourage you to do this. In fact, when you're in, if you're making a phase one application, they will not allow you to ask for an indirect rate of more than 40% unless you have written negotiated indirect rate history with another agency. So they don't make it easy to do, and they effectively call this a, quote, safe rate. Um, and they allow you an indirect rate of up to 40% of all direct costs. Now, I'm going to explain to you the two simple ways to commit what we call inadvertent fraud. So step one, you don't ask for more than a 40% indirect rate. The grant specialist does a cursory pre-award audit. You do not negotiate a rate. DFAS doesn't get involved. You don't really understand whether your accounting system is good or not, but you don't really care because they just gave you $1.5 million and you're off to the races. Part C, you improperly draw down funds from the payment management system more than you earn. And I, and I'm gonna, I wanna make sure people understand this. So if you're a DOD contractor, you do a month's worth of work, you submit a bill to the government and you wait to get paid. With the NIH, if you get a $1.5 million award, they're going to take that money and put it up in the clouds, and they're going to basically give you a login name and password, and whenever you want money, you just basically go onto your computer, type the number in, and the money just appears in your bank account the, the next day. So it's a wonderful thing. You don't worry about cash flow. However, if you improperly draw down funds, and remember, if you overbill the government or draw down money you haven't earned, you're going to get yourself into trouble. So there's two ways people typically do that. Number one, they negotiate, or they ask for a 40% indirect rate, and they run at a rate that's less than that. So if you run at a 20% indirect rate in real life, and you're drawing down money at 40, you're overbilling the government. The other thing people don't understand is that if you don't negotiate an indirect rate and your indirect rate actually runs higher than the 40% and you use those drawdown funds to cover your indirect expenses, that's illegal as well. Your indirect rate is capped at whatever you proposed unless you negotiate your indirect rate. So if you put in a rate of 25% and your actual rate runs at 60 and you draw down the funds and say, hey, I'm spending this all on allowable things. I mean, the accountant told me I could spend this on rent and utilities and telephone and, and all sorts of stuff. That's illegal as well. Where this comes out is the financial report, the SF-425, where you are asked to reconcile your actual spending to what's been drawn. And this form, when you actually look at it, is done. it's done on a quarterly basis, and you basically submit it into the government and say, this is how much I've drawn for the quarter. This is, these are the grants that I earned it on. If you read line 13, by signing this report, I certify that it is true, complete, and accurate to the best of my knowledge, and I'm aware that any false, fictitious, or fraudulent information may subject me to criminal, civil, or administrative penalties. And there were two University of Houston professors convicted and sent to prison for a year. One of them was actually fined uh, $100,000. If you want to look into this, integrated microsensors, uh, do a Google search. Uh, there is a Washington State University professor right now who's under investigation. This just came out uh, a few months ago. Um, you know, they take this stuff very seriously, so please pay attention to it. So in general, the way we get involved, we tend to supplement your financial team. And I, you know, Maytel, when she started, she talked about how Freemind gets involved. I thought I'd give you an overview before I tell you how we get involved. We are a CPA firm. However, 80% of our revenue comes from us becoming the inside person for our clients. So we effectively become your part-time CFO or your part-time controller. We become part of your management team. 20% of the time, when we have an opportunity, a potential client presents as being incredibly well run, and they say, hey, can we hire you to do the uniform guidance or OMBA 133 audit? And as long as you're going to be clean, I'd be glad to do that. But if you're going to be a problem when I audit you, I would rather be your inside guy, fix you up, and then we'll go hire somebody else to audit you, because I can't do both. So what we tend to get involved with is the indirect cost rate development the financial negotiations with government officials, be they grant specialists, uh, procuring officers, 
um, the Division of Financial Advisory Services, the Defense Contract Audit Agency, what have you, we will help you set up your accounting system, get your internal people training, and provide periodic oversight depending on the strengths and weaknesses of, of your existing team. If you are negotiating an indirect rate, we will prepare that incurred cost submission on an annual basis and will represent you during those government audits. We've got uh, three introductory products uh, that help us start working with people. So if you don't have an acceptable accounting system and you want us to help you set one up, uh, we typically charge $2,250 for that. We've got a deal for uh, anybody who comes through our webinar system. This also, this 1995 also includes help with your indirect rate projection and cost proposal support. So you're not saving a couple of hundred dollars, you're saving over a thousand dollars. And if you have an existing accounting system and you're not sure if it's okay or not, we do what we call a risk and compliance analysis. So with that little sales pitch done, I will thank you for attending and I will um, push it back to Maytal who will now take Q&A and act as our moderator. So thank you for your time. Okay, thank you very much, Ed. That was incredibly interesting. Uh, you're still here, right? Ed? Sorry, what's that? I just wanted to make sure that you can still uh, speak. Okay. So, uh, just a few questions uh, that we got. Um, let me see. Is there now, are you asking people to use the Are you asking people to use the chat window, or are you unmuting them, or how are we doing this? No, no. So there's a chat window for questions. Uh, if okay. anyone has an additional question, please feel free to type that in. And we actually have quite a few, so we'll start with that. Okay. Okay, so uh, that's a question for me. Is there a minimum of percent effort that a PI should dedicate? So uh, we typically recommend uh, no, not less than 10%. Some solicitations require more than 10%. Uh, you can go all the way up to 50, but uh, of course, typically you would not have a PI dedicate 100% of his time uh, for the grant. So keep that in mind. Uh, is there an average indirect cost rate? So as Ed uh, said before, 40% uh, is the safe rate, as, he, as you called it. Um, many companies, especially academic institutes, have a different negotiated rate uh, with the NIH, with the government, but 40% I would say is definitely uh, the average. But what we recommend to do is just uh, add your uh, right, if your overhead rate is 20%, don't write 40. <laughs> You'll be surprised that. <laughs> uh, oh, okay. I'm not surprised by anything. Okay, that's good. <laughs> we, had a, we had a client in Silicon Valley uh, who proposed a 7% indirect rate, and his indirect rate was um, 20 times higher than that. So we see we see all kinds of crazy stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I concur. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh, let's uh, let's do one for you, Ed. How does the 40% indirect uh, cap on the NIH Phase One apply to Phase Two? So the NIH. Uh, if you're applying for your first phase one SBIR, they will not allow you to request an FNA rate of greater than 40% unless you have a written negotiated indirect rate with another agency. So if you're working with the Department of Defense and you have 120% indirect rate negotiated, you would then send that rate agreement letter to the Division of Financial Advisory Services and they will, uh, what they call normalize your indirect rate. So they will actually go back into the negotiation, the submission documents, and they will pull out. So if there's a difference between, um, you know, let's say you paid yourself $400,000, they will strip the allowable salary back to their salary cap. They will strip out IR&D costs. They will strip out any negotiated patent costs. So they will normalize and come up with a new rate. Um, with phase two, you can ask for whatever indirect rate you need. This is a, a huge psychological thing that most people need to get their arms around. Um, if you run a project, it's very easy to have an indirect rate less than 40%. If you're in an incubator, it's very easy to have an indirect rate of less than 40%. If your project starts to turn into a business and you start renting facilities and hiring people, 
it's incredibly difficult to have an indirect rate less than 40 percent. But the government's not making it easy for you to negotiate that indirect rate, and you hear lots of fears that people have about being uncompetitive. The problem is, if you don't have a way to cover that difference, if you're not VC-backed, angel-backed, um, borrowing money, or at, at least strategically, knowingly uh, subsidizing the grant, you're going to have cash flow problems and, and project losses, or you're going to be committing fraud. So there's sort of one, one of three things you can choose to do. Negotiate a rate, commit fraud, or dilute yourself. Any one of those three, uh, I would pick two. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, another thing I see here, what influences your ability to be aggressive in the negotiation indirect, in negotiating indirect costs? I assume that one's for me, Mital? Yeah. Yeah, so typically, um, I'll, I'll be very blunt with you, the lower your priority score, the more aggressive uh, it, it allows us to be. If you just squeaked over the pay line, um, it makes it difficult for us to be aggressive, but the more um, your priority score dictates, the more the government wants to fund you, uh, and it gives me, you know, a lot of swagger when I walk into the negotiation, so. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, that one now I want to and, and there's nothing and, and there's nothing like having real substantiation too I mean you know I can't make things up so <laughs> definitely <laughs> uh, okay let's see uh, one from me how much can you dedicate to salaries okay so that is uh, we get asked that pretty frequently uh, there is a salary cap it is a little over 180,000 uh, per year and if you add that to the, as you calculate the calendar months, uh, you have to take into account that the base salary cannot be higher than that. We know that uh, within the industry, some people get more than that, uh, but that is the, the cap. In terms of the budget itself, you can definitely um, allocate a specific portion to salaries, but you have to remember that thereafter, a science. So you don't want the salary portion of your um, your budget to be 70 percent. Um, it, it's a question that's a bit difficult to answer very generically. Uh, we usually look at it uh, and uh, make sure that we are able to match the, the best uh, the best portion in each one of the projects that we're uh, examining examining. Um, but uh, yeah, I hope that answers that question. Um, okay, and Ed, now one for you. How has the VC pool influenced the SBR awards that you see? Uh, the VC pools are, there is a strategic mindset when you're working with VCs, which is, um, this is a free $1.5 million, and they almost don't care. I mean, typically, from a company to get to point A to point B, they need usually tens of millions of dollars. And these, this is just one and a half million dollars, if it's a phase two SBIR, that the VC doesn't have to come up with. And they're so spending money on so many things, they don't typically care what the indirect rates are. They just want to make sure that their um, accounting system is compliant. The bootstrapped pool tends to care a lot more about their indirect rates uh, and tends to find the 40% rate more prohibitive. The, the government more and more finds it's easier to mitigate their risk um, by having somebody else think your idea is great other than them. So they, they sort of seem fascinated and um, enamored with the VC pools uh, because it seems to mitigate their risk a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And indirect rates as a result, um, you know, the the keep your indirect rate low mantra is really reinforced by the VC pools. You know, a VC, if you take the million and a half dollars and you're a bootstrap company and you need a 60% indirect rate, you're spending less money on direct costs. You may appear to be less, um, you know, reasonable than a VC pool. Uh, the guy asks for a 0% indirect rate and he spends $1.5 million all on direct expenses. The, the reality of the situation is you either solve the problem or you don't the technology or the innovation is either great or it isn't. 
Um, so a, a lot of times, you know, people are diluted by whether their innovation is great or not. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, so thank you for that. Uh, thank you all very much for joining. This is all the time that we have. Um, please feel free to contact uh, Ed or uh, me. You can see both our emails and numbers uh, on your screen now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ed. Thank you, everyone. And have a great day. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.